Welcome to this second episode of the Society of St. Thomas Aquinas. Welcome also to our second lecture video over the dogmatic tract on the one God. This is our second episode entitled The History and Methodology of Thomism. And as you can see, it's a fairly long lecture that we're going to be going over today, somewhat uh, laborious in the sense of the subject matter some of you may find. However, it's very important today that we go over this said section because number one, this is the introduction to Father Reginald Gergou Lagrange's commentary. So he's going to be laying out for us a, lit a little bit of the not just the history and methodology of Thomism, but also the groundwork before we launch into question one this next week over the Summa. However, uh, at the same time, it's also very important because we very much so, as we stressed in the last episode, don't want to make Thomism just the writings, the actual words of St. Thomas Aquinas, but we're also wanting to make sure that we're incorporating into it the larger Thomistic tradition, the commentator tradition, which flowed out from St. Thomas in the 13th century up until the 1950s. One real quick note before we begin, if you have not joined our email list for the Society of St. Thomas Aquinas, the email link will be in the description below. Also, some of you may know my name is Nicholas Cavazos. I am the traditional Thomist here on YouTube. And if you're watching this show, if you'd like to go over and donate to the work of this said apostle, you'll also see the donation link in the description below. All right, everyone, with that being said, let's go ahead and start off with a prayer, and then we will dive into the subject matter. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, kindle them the fire of thy love, send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. O God, who has taught the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost, grant us to enjoy that what is right in the same Holy Spirit, and ever to rejoice in his divine consolations. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. All right, with that, let's go ahead and dive into today's lecture, The History and Methodology of Thomism. All right, everyone, here we are at the first page of the One God Commentary by Father Reginald Gergou Lagrange. We're going to go ahead and dive into his introduction, which is going to be the main text that we're going to be covering in this lecture series. And then in the next episode, we're going to be going ahead and covering questions one uh, through six of the first question of the Summa Theologiae. One side note that you can see here, two important things, is that first and foremost, this work of his is going to be, uh, the imprimatur is in 1943. So this work is very much so a work that was made in the 1940s. Uh, and it was very common in that time period to have uh, theologians be writing commentaries on not just St. Thomas Aquinas' Summa, but on these larger dogmatic tracts that you have in the science of theology. Side note, I also enjoy his dedication to the Holy Mother of God, the author, most humbly dedicated this work as a token of gratitude and filial obedience. 
I think that's a very beautiful dedication. All right, and then right after the translator's preface, which um, I won't say too much about this translation. This translation is an okay translation of the One God commentary. However, I have heard some good critiques on it. Uh, thankfully, I know some of the spots where it's going to be kind of rough in translation. Uh, however, I won't say too much about that. However, as you can see here also, the table of contents laid out according to the questions in the Summa. Right, starting off with questions one, going all the way through questions 26. And this is where we're going to be beginning our discussion today. I'm going to go ahead and read through this larger uh, section of the introduction, as well as given, give some of my thoughts as we go through it. All right, so here we go. Again, the format of how this is going to work is I'm going to be teaching over this. And so how this is going to work is I'll be reading a section, giving some of my thoughts on this. Uh, so on and so forth. It will be much more discussional and lecture styled in future episodes. This one, again, is just covering the history and methodology of Thomism. So there's not going to be a ton of commentary by myself uh, as much as possible. All right, so beginning here, he says, Introduction, the importance of the significance of the theological summa of St. Thomas. So this first section, Father Lagrange is going to be talking about the importance of St. Thomas's Summa Theologiae in the broader context of theological history, uh, in the sense of how theology has been done, where does it fit, and its important role. And so he begins with saying, since this volume is an explanation of the first part of the Theological Summa of St. Thomas, so the tract on the one God, it is evident by way of introduction first to show the importance or value of the, significate, of the significance of this work from two points of view, historical and theoretical. Our reference to history of theology concerns only those matters about which one is not allowed to plead ignorance. So he's now going to be giving a really short, rough um, timeline of the history of theology. And when he says that no one is allowed to plead ignorance, this is something that, again, in a, in a theological school, you should not be ignorant of. You, sh you should have these time periods, if you will, of the theological history um, stamped out in your brain. And again, this is a rough sketch of this. There's a there's a good work uh, out there. I believe it's just even called the History of Thomism, which is like 200 pages. Uh, they can be much more further in depth than Father Lagrange is going to get into. However, he continues and he says, first, in the history of theology in general, generally, three periods are distinguished. First, we have the patristic period, so that's the time of the church fathers, which extends from the first century to the eighth. And this is chiefly apologetic, polemic, and positive. So during this time of theology, the the writings of the early church fathers were chiefly apologetic, so writing uh, apologetics, Catholic apologetics, against the heresies that were going on in that day, whether they be the Gnostics, the Dantists, the Montanists, etc. Or you also have polemic and positive, positive theology being uh, really looking at the sources, right? So going and commenting on the texts of Holy Scripture, etc. Then we have the period of the Middle Ages from the 8th century to the 15th, and this is the scholastic period. Finally, there is the modern period from the 16th century to the present time, and this period is chiefly positive and critical. So the medieval ages, again, the, the, the way theology is done is chiefly scholastic in tone, and in the modern period, which that is the 1940s for Lagrange, he is saying that theology is chiefly positive and critical. Positive, again, being going back to the sources, so going back to the sources of Holy Scripture and the patristics, as well as critical, meaning good crit textual criticism. If I had to include a little bit of my own commentary, as some of you may know, I would also argue that, especially right now, we're living in a fourth age of theology, which is uh, maybe you could describe it as decadent or lack thereof of theology. Since particularly the 1960s, we've had a major collapse in not just scholastic theology, but just um, really good sound theology in general. And unfortunately, now we have uh, heretical theologies that are being taught uh, here, there, and everywhere in large numbers. This is part of the reason of this show, is to help you uh, get equipped with good theology. In each successive age, the progress of theology is clearly seen. Since whatever period we take, a certain function of theology comes particularly into prominence according to the necessities of the times. In the, this evolution, we have the manifestation of something that is truly providential. Side note, when he says evolution, he's not referring to evolution as in 
uh, a change of kinds in the sense of a dogma being changed from kinds. Rather, he's talking about a development from one period to another. He continues, thus, in the patristic period, to the time of the church fathers, it is primarily apologetic in the second century for the conversion of the world from paganism to Christianity. It afterwards becomes chiefly polemic in tone, being directed particularly against the heresies cropping up with the, uh, with the fold, within the fold of the church. And these heresies such as Arianism, Nestorianism, Monophytism are concerned with the more important dogmas such as the Trinity, Incarnation, and the Redemption. Theology must then defend the principles of faith from the very sources of revelation, namely from Holy Scripture and tradition. Thus, theology gradually assumes the form which is called positive. That, it, it, that is, it gathers together the various points of revealed doctrine as contained in Holy Scripture and in divine tradition. But a systematic theology combining is of faith and what is connected with it is also the form of one body of teaching. Did not exist in the patristic period except in certain works of St. Augustine and St. John Damascene. So again, in this first section or time period, if you will, of theology, we see that theology is chiefly um, trying to convert the world, right? Trying to convert the pagan world, the pagan world of Rome, ancient Rome, into the fold of the Catholic Church. Then you also see that theology is also chiefly, uh, there's a lot of apologetics in the sense that it's fighting off the different heresies that are cropping up inside of the early church, so Arianism, Nestorianism, etc. And then you also have as well, the theology very much so is positive in the sense of going back to the sources of Holy Scripture and divinely revealed tradition. Again, we as Catholics believe that God's revelation is contained under two sources, Holy Scripture and sacred tradition. I myself, I hold the partum partum view of the Council of Trent that you need to have both of them fundamentally uh, in order to attain the, the fullness, if you will, of revelation. However, we see that one thing that is lacking in the early church is a systematic way of theology being laid out, except potentially in a couple of the works of St. Augustine and St. John Damascene. You don't have that strong scholastic system. To continue, he says, but in the second period of the Middle Ages, we find systematic or scholastic theology definitely established, which didactically and speculatively expounds and defends what is of faith and which deduces from it theological conclusions. Thus, there is gradually formed a body of teaching which, though subordinate to what is strictly strictly of faith, includes the science of theology as it is commonly accepted in the church, and which transcends by reason of the universality and certainty the various theological systems more or less in opposition to one another. In this age, the theological summae were written, which are so-called because each is a complete treatise on all subjects pertaining to theology, and according as these various subjects are considered under the light of the higher principles of faith and reason. So, my viewers, in this time of the uh, second period, if you will, of theology, in the time of the Middle Ages, this is my favorite personal time period of the Catholic theology, you see theology becoming systematic or scholastic in nature. You're seeing the theological summe being written, the theological summe being taking the writings of Holy Scripture and sacred tradition, synthesizing this with reason under the umbrella of the great magisterium. And this is going to be a system which is going to cover all uh, the subjects pertaining to theology. So obviously the subjects pertaining to the one God and the Trinity, but also issues such as the redemption, the incarnation, the sacraments, ecclesiology, et cetera, et cetera. This is going to be what you're going to see very much so happening in the time of the Middle Ages. And this is the time that St. Thomas Aquinas' Summa is written. The third or modern period, theology again becomes chiefly polemic and positive against the Protestants and apologetic apologetical against the rationalists. We may call this third period critical or reflexive. In this period, too, we see clearly the progress made in theology, since critical reflection normally follows direct uh, knowledge. As St. Thomas says, quote, human reasoning by way of seeking and finding advances from certain things simply understood, namely the first principles, and again, by the way of the judgment returns by analysis to the first principles in which the light in which the light, in the light of which it examines what is what it has found, end quote. 
Thus, in the third period, we find developing a more critical knowledge against uh, critical knowledge and defense against Protestants and rationalists of the very foundations of faith or sources of revelation, namely Holy Scripture and divine tradition. And as a result of this, we have the fundamental treatise on revelation, the church, the De Locis, or the theological sources, this being the being a scientific method of sacred theology. In this, we readily see the progress made in theology, which, like a tree, grows and is perpetually renewed as a result of the more diligent efforts made in acquiring a knowledge of sources, these being, as it were, the roots from which it proceeds." End quote. So in this time of third, uh, this third period of theology, we again see theology become much more apologetic in tone, right? It's defending itself against uh, the rationalists, right? This, this modern critical rationalist system, as well as polemic and positive, right? Going back and fighting uh, over the proper interpretation of the scriptures with the Protestant errors that are very much so common. But one of the good things that you do see come out of this time period, as he says about maybe three-fourths of the way down in this paragraph after the quotation by St. Thomas, he says, thus in the third period, we find developing a more critical knowledge and defense against Protestants and rationalists of the very foundations of faith or sources of revelation, holy scripture and divine tradition. And as a result of this, we have the fundamental treatise on revelation, the church, the De Logis, the theological sources, this being a scientific method of sacred theology. In the future, the Society of St. Thomas Aquinas will be coming out with a uh, episode and a whole series over the over divine revelation. You'll also find this on the traditional Thomist show itself. We'll be going through Father Lagrange's two massive volumes on revelation, uh, talking about this, as well as uh, in the future, I believe we're, we potentially might be going through a uh, a series on the Sacra Theologiae Summa, which is the great larger 1950s uh, traditional Jesuit uh, theological manuals that has stretched about eight volumes, but it's very good. Uh, we might have an early dogmatic series going on on that. Stay tuned for more information. He continues and he says, we should note in the history of theology three brilliant epics, each following immediately the close of an ecumenical council. Thus, after the first uh, Council of Nicaea in 325 against Arianism, and in the fourth century, the beginning of the in the beginning of the fifth century, the greater fathers of the Church flourished. In the East, we see Greek the Greek Church. We have Saint Athanasius, Saint Basil, Saint Gregory of uh, Nazianzus, Saint Gregory of Nyssa, Saint John Chrysostom, Saint Cyril of Alexandria. In the West, we have Saint Hilary, Saint Ambrose, Saint Jerome, Saint Augustine, and Saint Leo the Great. Similarly, in the Sepic second epoch after the fourth lateran council held in the year 1225 against the albigensians and waldensians the 13th century saw the rise of the great theologians saint albert the great alexander of hales saint bonaventure and saint thomas finally the third brilliant epoch in the history of theology at the time of the council of trent from 15 uh, from 1545 to 1563 even before this time, there had already been celebrated theologians such as Cajetan, Sylvester of Ferrara, and during this period of the council, and after afterwards too, we have Soto, Benes, Tolet, Midian, and the Salamakians, John of St. Thomas, and Suarez in speculative, speculative theology. But all of these theologians are commentators of the Summa of St. Thomas, even as Suarez, also the pursuer of his own electic method. During the same period, we have Cano, St. Robert Bellarmine, Naltus, Alexander, Bosset, and prominent in the uh, art of con controversy, and in the exegesis, we have the Maldontus, Cornelius da Lapide, and others. In like manner, after the Vatican Council, 1869 to, uh, to 1870, there is a revival of the theology in the works of Joseph Culton, uh, SJ, so Jesuit, uh, as well as many other Jesuit writers, as you can see. And in the revival of Thomism, we have Servano, Cornelidi, Zargali, and others. And several of his encyclicals, especially in uh, Attorney Patris in 1879, Pope Leo XIII highly recommends the doctrine of St. Thomas. So one thing that uh, Lagrange is bringing up here is he's bringing up these three epics, if you will, of uh, theological flourishing. The first one being after the Council of Nicaea, the second one being after the Fourth Lateran Council, and the third one being at the time of the Council trend and following.
uh, the pur the purpose of what he's doing is he's laying out, as he's saying, through really good ecumenical councils that really do the job of the church well, proclaiming dogma in a clear fashion uh, and enforcing it with a clear fashion, um, you see a great flourishing of Catholic theology. Unfortunately, we don't see this very much so in our day. Unfortunately, uh, in the 1960s and 70s with the um, Second Vatican Council, we see very much so a drop in good theology, uh, the total abandonment of traditional Catholic moral theology and scholasticism, as well as uh, kind of an ad lib uh, experimentum, if you will, uh, attitude applied to theology. Very much so everything is in the world of experiments. Continuing, he says, from the fact that these three golden ages of sacred theology flow in the wake of, an e of ecumenical councils, it is seen how the Holy Spirit directs by the living voice of the authoritative teaching of the church, the progressive knowledge of dogmatic truths with regard to these matters that are of faith and the progress of theology in questions subordinate to faith. For God, by his special providence, watches over his science, that is, theology, which is the strict, which in the strict sense is the science of God proceeding from the divine revelation. On the other hand, and in these three generally accepted periods, preparations were somehow made for these ecumenical councils then held by reason of the inquiries of the theologians during these times of preparation. Thus, human labor is the dis is the dispositing cause, and time and God assisting the church teaching is the practical cause of the progressive understanding of dogma in the matters of faith and also in the consequence of this of the progress itself made in theology right so it's very much so through the leading of the holy ghost with the ecumenical councils as well as uh, recognizing that god is guiding his science this is something that is very important to recognize and this is one of these logical questions that we really have to ask ourselves which is we have our lord say right in saint matthew's gospel that christ will be with his church to the end of the world and that christ uh, promises that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church God does guard over his theology, right? He guards over his science. Therefore, when you have such a, you know, beautiful scholastic tradition that grows uh, out of the De Logis, out of the sources of truth, out of the theological sources, and you see such beautiful flourishing of theology and then such a harsh abandonment to it and almost a complete abandonment to it, you really have to ask yourself, uh, where is the hand of the Lord today? Are we being chastised? I, I personally think that that's the case in our own day. It is to be observed that in each of these three periods, there is a certain preparation of time, a certain time of preparation, a time of splendor, and a stationary time when compendiums and compilations make their appearance. Compl compilations make their appearance. Finally, there is a period of more or less pronounced decline, as in the 7th, 14th, and 18th centuries. In the time of splendor, a wonderful harmony in the various functions of theology is particularly in evidence, a harmony which the, fun the human mind cannot attain suddenly. Generally speaking, during the time of preparation, there are two tendencies, to some extent, opposed to each other because of the certain excess in each case. Some, for instance, exaggerate the necessity of speculation as in the Alexandrian, as the Alexandrian school does. Others devote themselves exclusively to the positive study of Holy Scripture as the school of Antioch does. Likewise, in the Middle Ages in the 12th century, Abelard, assign, uh, assigning too much to the role of reason, falls into many errors, while on the other hand, several of the school of St. Victor stress too much on the mystical element and do not rely sufficiently upon reason. Contrary to this, in the Golden Age, especially in the 13th century, the doctors succeed in effecting a marvelous reconciliation between the various functions of theology, which is the preferred, which is perfected in its positive, speculative, and even effective aspects. For we then see all the great theologians writing commentaries on Holy Scripture as they have profound knowledge of the teachings of the fathers, and they are conspicuous for their wisdom or exalted pre preception of the mysteries that are found productive of the fruits of Christian life. This we see in the case of the 13th century in which we in which we detect notable differences as to the genus, inclination, and method among the greater theologians. Thus, St. Bonaventure, in, the works, in his works, generally faithful to the teaching of St. Augustine, his preference is for the Platonic instead of the Aristotelian philosophy, 
giving precedence to the will over the intellect, and he devotes himself more to mystic contemplation than to speculative theology. And at the same time, St. Albert the Great, who is, the pro who is profoundly versed in the philosophical subjects, purges Aristotelian philosophy of its errors injected into it by the Arabian commentators and accommodates it to the use of theology as the instrument that is more precise and exact than Platonic philosophy. Finally, St. Thomas completed what St. Albert had begun. He showed the value of the foundations of Aristotelian philosophy with regard to the first ideas and the first principles of reason, as also is determining the cons constitutive principles of both natural things and human, th human nature. Thus, thus have determines more accurately what is the proper object of our intellect and hence what absolutely transcends our natural knowledge and even the natural knowledge of any created intellect. Better, therefore, than any of his predecessors, St. Thomas distinguished between natural reason and supernatural faith, which he showed how they were interrelated with the wonderful logic order he expounds the various parts of theology according as it treats of god as he is in himself and how all things proceed from him how he is the final end of all things thus he collected all the theological materials so as to form one body of doctrine and this he did by a display of qualities rarely united in one individual namely with great simplicity with great simplicity as well as profound profundity of thought, and also with great rigor of logic, as well as with a deep sense of the inaccessibility of the mysteries. Therefore, his doctrine was praised in the highest terms by the, same, uh, by the Supreme Pontiffs. Leo XIII wrote as follows, quote, Among the scholastic doctors, the chief and master of all, Tower St. Thomas Aquinas, who, as Cajetan observes, because he most venerated the ancient doctors of the church in a certain way seems to have inherited the intellect of all, end quote. The doctrines of those illustrious men, like these uh, scattered members of a body, St. Thomas collected together the and cemented, distributed in a wonderful order, and so increased with important additions that he is rightly and deservedly esteemed as the special bulwark and glory of the Catholic faith. So what what uh, Father Lagrange is saying through all of these things is two things. One, he outlines and he shows a lot of this great scholastic tradition that has come before and also in tandem with St. Thomas. So you see with every good ecumenical council, you see a time of flourishing, and then you also see a time of fading. But you also see within these these great uh, leaders who are synthesizing right faith and reason. You have St. Bonaventure, right? And uh, who is very much so falling after St. Augustine, who's very Neoplatonic in a lot of his aspects, right? Very Platonic in his conceptions when it comes to the will. But then you have great authors such as St. Albert the Great, right? The teacher of St. Thomas Aquinas, purging the errors of the Arabians, right? The, er the errors of, whether that be of Averroes or other commentators, uh, and purifying those Aristotelian um, text and then saint thomas synthesizing that with all theology whether that be sacred scripture whether that be the work of uh the church fathers the doctors of the church that came uh, before him things along that nature and he holds therefore a place in the church as a supreme doctor right as a doctor uh who is a special bulwark or defense of the catholic faith that's why Pope St. Pius X sometimes is known for saying that, you know, if you have a problem in theology, go to Thomas, and that all theologians need to be judged by Thomas in the sense that they cannot disagree with the principles of, of St. Thomas Aquinas. Wanting to know more about the theological authority of St. Thomas Aquinas, I have a video on the traditional Thomist show that talks about specifically uh, the the why Saint, why Thomism is uh, needed inside of the church and talks very much so about the authority of Aquinas. To continue, he says, moreover, and he's quoting now again, quote, moreover, the angelic doctor pushed his philosophical conclusions into the reasons and principles of things which are almost uh, comprehensive and contain in their bosom, so to say, the seeds of almost infinite truths to be unfolded in good times by the latter masters and with a good yield. And as he is 
also used this philosophical method in the refutation of error. He won the title uh, uh, to distinction for himself. The single hand, uh, that single handed, he ver uh, victoriously combated the errors of former times and supplied invincible arms to rout those which might in after times spring up. Again, clearly distinguishing as it is fitting reason from faith, which happily associating the one with the other, he both preserved the rights and had regard to the dignity of each, so much so, indeed, that reason born on the wings of Thomas is to human height, is to its human height can scarcely rise higher, while faith could scarcely expect more a stronger aid from reason than those which she already obtained through Thomas. In the same encyclicals, various testimonies of the sovereign pontiffs were quoted, and we would draw a special attention to the crowning point of these, which is the judgment by Innocent the Sixth, who writes, quote, His teaching above that of others, the canons alone excepted, possess such an ex excellence of phraseology, a manner of statement, and a soundness in its propositions, that those who hold to it are never found swerving from the path of truth, and he who dares to assail it with uh, will always be found suspect of error, end quote. After the 13th century, scholastic theology gradually began to decline. Just as it follows the age of the greater fathers after the 4th and 5th centuries, we have the minor fathers from the 6th and the 8th centuries. Even after the beginning of the 14th century, John Dunn Scotus and many of his metaphysical questions receded from the logic method of St. Thomas and established a new school of thought. Dunn Scotus disagrees with St. Thomas on two points. Before we get into these two points, uh, where John Scotus disagrees, one important note for you, the viewer, is to pay attention to some of these names. For instance, Don Scotus or Suarez, these are going to be theologians of different theological schools that are going to be brought up uh, very much so in commonplace inside of this uh, commentary. Also, great commentators like Cajetan, John of St. Thomas, and such. So where do Don Scotus principally disagree with St. Thomas? So in these two things. First, he admits a new distinction, namely that actual form distinction on the part of the object, which he considers a possible distinction between the real and the logical, whereas the Thomists say that the distinction either precedes the consideration of the mind and is real, or else it does not, and then it is logical. There is no possible intermediary. Scoda substitutes this formal distinction sometimes for the real distinction which St. Thomas holds, for instance, between created essence and existence, between the soul and its faculties, and between the faculties themselves, and thus he paves the way for nominalism. But sometimes Scotus tends toward extreme realism, substituting the formal distinctions of the logical uh, distinctions which distinction which St. Thomas admits, for instance, between the divine attributes and between the various metaphysical grades in the created being, for instance, between animity, vitality, substance, and being. Hence, being is con conceived as unequivocal, for the distinction between being and for the substance of both God and the creatures is formal, before any consideration of the mind. This new teaching... Metaphysics does not, according to the Thomists, escape the danger of pantheism. For it, for it, the created substance and the divine substance are outside of being created. They are formal distinguished from as object realities. They are the non-entities because outside of being, it is not being. And so there would be none less one thing. Moreover, by such formalism, scholasticism ends up ends in the subtlety ends in subtleties and in a war of words the second thing he says voluntarism is another innovation introduced by scotus thus he maintains that the distinction between the order of grace and grace depends on god's free will as if grace were not supernaturally essential but only actually so this same voluntarism makes scotus affirm that god could have established another natural moral law regarding the duties among human beings and so he could revoke such precepts as, quote, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, end quote. Thus, Scotus paves the way for the contingency of positivism and of nominalists in the 14th century.
After the same Roger Bacon, a prodigy of Irid, not free from the rash opinions, here and there in his writing speaks with contempt of Aristotle's philosophy of St. Albert and of St. Thomas, whom he calls children. Some interesting takes there, uh, uh, Roger Bacon. Thomas Sutton, Dominican, said to be the said to be English by birth in 1310, was among others who, in his commentaries on the fourth books of the sentences, right, the sentences of Peter Lombard, who we talked about last week, wrote in, or last session, wrote in defense of St. Thomas against Scotus, between St., uh, but, but Peter Allures, Anthony Andre, Richard Knowltown took up the defense of Scotus's doctrine, and Gerard and Bonn strove to reconcile the opinions of each school, so the Thomas and the Scotus. Through the 14th century and in the early 5th, uh, 15th century, scholastic theology gradually resolved itself into a war of words, rallies, and useless subtleties. The chief reason for this decline was the revival of nominalism, which contains that, univer that universals are merely concepts of the mind or common names. Hence, not even an imperfect knowledge of the nature of those things can be acquired, whether of corporeal things or of the soul and of its faculties, or of the foundations of the natural law or the essence of grace, or and of the essential distinction between it and our nature. And then you see the progress that nominalism, right, that uh, philosophical error makes, because it, as it continues, he says, thus the advocates of nominalism deny the principle that there are faculties, habits, and acts are specified by the formal object. Wherefore, nominalists, especially William of Ockham, despised the sound and lofty doctrine of their predecessors, prepared the downfall of the solid scholastic theology, and prepared for the errors of Luther, whose teachers in the school of Wittenberg were nominalists. This is something that I know is somewhat controversial today in the sense of was Luther fully a nominalist or not. One thing we do know is that Father Grange's assertion here is that uh, he was at least definitely influenced by nominalists in a certain sense uh, because his teachers at the School of Wittenberg were nominalists themselves. Though it's a controversial organization, I do recommend actually watching the Society of St. Pius X's video on the subject of nominalism, I think does a fairly good job if you're wanting to know more about that said subject. In the 15th century, a revival in scholastic theology began with John Quirles, Dominican, who is called the Prince of Thomas, and Juan de Torquemada, who wrote the Summa de Ecclesia with Cajetan, distinguished defender of Thomistic doctrine, who was practically the first in the schools to explain the theological Summa of St. Thomas instead of the sentences. In this same period, we have Conrad Colin, another Dominican, 1536, who wrote a series of commentaries on the Summa Contra Dentilis. These last-mentioned theologians prepared the way for the theology of modern times, which began with the 16th century. Its first task was to refute the errors of its times, namely Protestantism, Banianism, and Jansenism. These attuned forms of Lutheranism deny the essential distinctions between the order of nature and that of grace, and give a distorted notion of predestination and divine notions. So to comment on a couple of these things, we see that uh, particularly, first and foremost, with uh, Cajetan, and also uh, a couple of these other theologians, John Capolis, Juan de Torque de Mara, etc., that these are going to be the first Dominicans, really, who are going to shift, spe spe especially Cajetan, from the writing about uh, or commenting on the sentences of Peter Lombard, and now we're going to be talking about theological summa. They're now going to be uh, writing commentaries on that. And through their works, right, and through Conrad Colen writing on the Summa Contra Gentilis, we're going to see an open door now from the transition from the time of the writing of uh, works on particularly the sentences of Peter Lombard into the writings of Aquinas now being the main focal point of reference uh, in the sense of scholastic theology. We're also going to see that the reason these theologians are doing this is because the church is now putting up a bulwark or a shield or a defense against the many errors that were going around in the 16th century, which Father Lagrange lists them Protestantism and Jansenism are probably the most well-known of the two, but Bainianism itself is also extremely dangerous. He continues to says, most prominent among these controversialists who labored to refute these errors, so the errors above mentioned, are St. Robert Bellarmine, right? And you can read that in his great work, The Controversies. The Dominican Cano and Bosset. Among scholastic theologians in the Dominican order, we have Victoria, Soto, Benes, John of St. Thomas, Gonet. The, Carmel uh, the Carmelites, who we have the theologians of 
Salamaca, right, who were over in Spain, who wrote the best commentaries of the works of St. Thomas. They were a good conservative Thomistic uh, school that was in Spain that I, I definitely recommend going back and reading a bit uh, about. But you'll see their their works uh, very frequently referenced. If you also read the works of St. Uh, Alphonsus Liguori, you see them recommended strongly in the context of moral theology. In the Society of Jesus, so the Jesuits, back in the good old days, we have Toletus, Suarez, Molin, and Logo who proposed a different interpretation of the angelic doctor's teaching. Suarez, the electic, sought a, to steer a middle course between St. Thomas and Scotus, a recede less than Molin did from the Thomistic doctrine on predestination and grace. So you see the Jesuit school very much so kind of peel off in certain circumstances from the Dominican school, and this actually ended up leading to the big rivalry uh, between the two on different theological issues, just like the Dominicans and the Franciscans on different theological issues. Eminent and positive theology, right, so on theological sources, uh, if you will, scripture and tradition, during this time we have uh, Batavis, uh, Thomasin, Kobefitz, and others. In the 18th century, there was a gradual decline in theology from the former splendor. So by the time of the 18th century, you have scholasticism really, you know, proceed well in the 13th century, 14th century, but latter 14th century, early 15th century, it starts to web. 16th century with the Council of Trent, you see a great flourishing again, right? You see really the theological conversation shift from the time uh, or from commenting on the sentences of Peter Lombard to now commentating on the Summa Theologiae by St. Thomas Aquinas. And then you see after that, right, you see uh, the great commentators, right, from the, all the different orders, whether they be Carmelites, Dominicans, Jesuits, Franciscans, etc. But then you see by the time of the 18th century, it starts to wade, if you will. It starts to, uh, uh, the ebb and flowing is starting to slow down. So you see a decline in theology, yet we still have such Thomas as Charles René Ballard and Cardinals Louis uh, Gatti, who defended the teaching of the angelic doctor with clarity and soundness of arguments. St. Alphonsus Liguori, right, great, great, uh, great doctor of the church, who wrote particularly on moral subjects, has finally the title of a doctor of the church. Finally, after the French Revolution, so probably one of the worst events in human history, and the Napoleonic Wars, when peace was again restored, the study of both positive and speculative theology gradually began to flourish, and later on, uh, a special incentive was offered for the advancement of theology by the Vatican Council. So for Vatican I is when you see Vatican Council in these older works, that's referring to Vatican I in the condemnation of positivism and agnosticism. The fruits of this were seen in modernism, again condemned by Pius X, Pope St. Pius X. This sovereign pontiff, like Leo XIII, again, highly recommended the study of St. Thomas's works and wrote, quote, but we warn teachers to bear in mind that a slight departure from the teaching of, of Aquinas, especially in metaphysics, is very detrimental. As Aquinas himself says, quote, a slight error in the beginning is a great error in the end, end quote. Finally, in the Code of Canon Law promulgated by the authority of Benedict XV in 1819, says, quote, and this is the 1917 Code of Canon Law, mental philosophy, Mental philosophy and theology must be taught according to the method, teaching, and principles of the angelic doctor to which the professor should rigorously adhere, end quote. This is stated again in the new law for the directive promulgated by Pius XI. All these testimonies, whether of the sovereign pontiffs or of the theologians who always have recourse to the theological summa of St. Thomas, most clearly proclaim its value and significance. All know of the theological works that have been written in recent times concerning the theological summae. Right, so to summarize a bit of that, you see with the ebbing and flowing in the time of the 18th century, you do still see really good theologians, particularly St. Alphonsus Liguori, right, who is very well steeped in the Thomistic tradition himself. That's why you do see really good, for instance, traditional orders of redemptress, like the Transalpine Redemptress being highly Thomistic, uh, and other great priestly orders, such as the Fraternity of St. Peter, Institute of Christ the King, Society of St. Pius X, Institute of the Good Shepherd, etc., being highly Thomistic in fashion uh, today. You see, uh, after the time, really during the time of the French Revolution, a total destruction of Catholic life in France, not just in scholastic theology, but also even all the way down into just um, faithful piety, but you do see a resurgence that comes from, uh, what's it called, from this in the context of Catholics really fighting for their faith. 
as well as in the time of the First Vatican Council, you see the condemnations of such errors as positivism, agnosticism, rationalism, uh, semi-rationalism, etc., and as well as the fruit, if you will, being uh, Thomas Aquinas is the defense. Thomism is the defense. Uh, and you see this promulgated by Leo XIII in Attorney Patris. Uh, you see that Pope St. Pius X, he uses this as a weapon against the greatest heresy, the heresy of modernism, uh, which if you want to know more about, go you can go ahead and watch the, the show that I, I have on the traditional Thomist on that said subject. Uh, but then also you see this promulgated by Benedict XV in the 1917 Code of Canon Law, enshrining Thomism even further, and then also continued further that in the context of Canon Law by Pope Pius XI. Now what we're going to do is we're going to shift over to specifically, that's a broad understanding of Thomistic history and of theological history. It's very broad. Um, now we're going to shift into the method of St. Thomas Aquinas, more about his methodology. We're going to talk about the different, like, is his method a good method? How theology should be done according to his method? And then we're also going to get into more of the contemplative aspect of how St. Thomas wrote his theological summa. So he says here on page number nine, he says, the method of St. Thomas, especially the structure of the articles of the Theological Summae. Uh, many seem to think that the, before Descartes wrote his discourse on method, traditional philosophy was not yet fully and unmistakably cognizant of the rules governing sound reasoning for the construction and teaching of knowledge. Many others, on the contrary, think that Descartes, Right, who you could say is the father of modern philosophy in a certain sense, who despised history and his predecessors could easily have found out from these latter and true rules of method. Some logicians, so students in the study of logic, are, ev are even of the opinion that the discourse on method could have been written more scientific than Descartes, one in accordance with the teaching of Aristotle and St. Thomas. I should like in this article to explain briefly the main features of St. Thomas's method. Let us see first by way of, of a statement of the question what several of our contemporaries have to say about it. Then we shall examine how the angelic doctor found the foundation, found a solid foundation of his method in Aristotle's writings and how he made use of this analysis in the inductive inquiry and also of the synthesis of, de of demonstration. Finally, we shall see how he closely connected his analysis and synthesis in the light of divine contemplation. So again, that's going to be kind of the structure of us diving into this. When he says, again, our contemporaries, he's again talking about his contemporaries in the 1940s. Uh, but this very much so, his contemporaries, their, his, the contemporaries' critique of Aquinas' method is actually very pertinent to our own day and age, as you'll see further, uh, especially if you're more well-versed in the context of theological uh, discussions. But then we're also going to see uh, a fuller understanding of his method, as well as how this is connected to Aquinas' divine contemplation, because one problem that you see oftentimes people run into is that people try to separate the study of theology from the mystical life, and one must have both to understand properly the whole system as a whole. If you're wanting to see more in-depth commentary on this, again, I recommend you go watch my Sancta Sapiencia series on this said subject, and you'll find out a little bit more of my personal opinions as we go through some of these things. He now begins, and he says, on various judgments about his method. So he's going to get now into his contemporaries' critiques of the scholastic method. He says, nowadays there are some who say that the method of St. Thomas is too scholastic and artificial, that it is not sufficiently historical and real. It is, as they say, too much in a a priori method, and almost always a process of deduction and analysis, or else in the analysis itself there is too much abstraction and even seems at times to confound logic abstractions with the objectivity of things. Some, though not realizing realizing that they are anomalous nowadays, assert that St. Thomas, speaking sometimes of matters of form, sometimes of matter and form, of essence and existence, as if they were distinct realities, end quote. And you can see right there, he's quoting now in foot num num number 13, a contemporary, right? which says, quote, if we wanted to remain true to the tradition of the schools, we should be led to believe that from the beginning, Thomism committed the mistake of confusing the logical and real, end quote. St. Thomas speaks of the essence as it were of reality. He reasons about the matter of form of corporeal things as if they were distinct realities that are in opposition, end quote. 
when we look again up here, it says now, to be sure, for the angelic doctor, even before any consideration of the mind, matter is not form, created essence is non-existence, and therefore, any of the consideration of the mind, matter is distinct from form and essence from existence, yet form and essence are not. For St. Thomas, uh, that which is, but that which by, that by which something is or does, it follows that they are merely logical entities and not realities. But in these days, many no longer know how to distinguish between metaphysical abstraction, direct consideration, and logic abstraction from reflex consideration. Therefore, they think only which is real, namely the concrete singular. Hence, for them, the abstract object not only is concrete, but is not real. And thus, the essence of man, of virtue, of society, of such things would not be any real, and the whole metaphysics, not accepting the principle of contradiction, would be reduced to logic, log log logical abstractions, logical being, or, as they say, to extreme intellectualism, that is without reality and lifeless. They would not dare to say explicitly that the abstract principles of contradiction, that something cannot be at the same time be and not be, is not a law of real, but being but only a logical governing the operations of the mind as the laws of syllogisms are. To such an extreme admission, however, it is not brought but by, by this silly. Moreover, several say that the method of St. Thomas often proceeds not according to the natural way in which the mind operates, but in the conventional way of the schools of the 13th century, namely by first proposing objections, at least three, which might be proposed afterward with better results. For, placed at the beginning, they are the source of obscurity rather than of light to the mind. So as you can see, this is a critique, a critiquing Aquinas's method on uh, the 13th century way of um, proposing objections and solutions. Further, it is indeed surprising that some say St. Thomas begins by setting forth the errors, introducing them with the formula venentur quod non, and only after this comes the true doctrine, which is proved in very few words, by an appeal to authority more at length, however, in a theoretical manner, and finally in the objection solved. So in these uh, critiques that these men are labeled, are giving St. Thomas, they're critiquing his method, saying that uh, on the one hand, right, that it is too abstract, too technical, too scholastic in fashion. They're also critiquing the 13th century conventional way of the schools, proposing objections before giving solutions, this being a hindrance to uh, true education as opposed to a light. Uh, it, it's like a cloud being brought over the sun. It's not helping. This is their objections. Paul Legrand says, therefore, some nowadays in philosophy and also in speculative theology depart from this method, which they say is too scholastic. Already in the time of blessed Pius IX, as is evident from the 13th proclamation of the syllabus, several said, quote, the method and principles by which the old scholastic doctors cultivated theology are not at all suitable for the demands of our times and for the progress of our, of the sciences, end quote. This again, right, as you can see here, uh, footnote number 16, uh, Denzinger 17, 13 in the old Denzinger copy, the 1957 Denzinger edition. Uh, this is going to be a condemned statement that Pope Pius IX is laying out in his syllabus of errors, error number uh, that he's laying out here. Uh, this error, again, being this idea that the scholastic method, right, that was used by the scholastic doctors is um, not efficient, right, for the modern times of man. He continues, some not considering the profound difference between St. Thomas's method a procedure and the merely a priori or synthetic method adopted by Spinoza seem to admit that St. Thomas's method and even St. Bonaventure's from the abuse of philosophical deduction lead to rationalism and pantheonism as clearly seen from the propositions to which the sacred congregation of the index ordered Augustine Bonti to give his assent in 1855 in writing. And you can also see that footnote number 17, again, Dinsinger, the older 1957 edition, 1652 numbered. Now, some depart from St. Thomas's method, preferring the historical, not only for the useful and necessary investigation in the history of philosophy and theology, but also for a more or less direct knowledge or of even philosophical or theological truth. 
this mode of procedure was indeed already vo in vogue among the followers of idealistic evolution, especially with Hegel, and later on we come across it through a modified form in many of the works of modern authors. Whatever these modifications may be, this method, so it seems, tends by its very nature to confuse philosophy with the history of philosophy, and thus is established a certain philosophy of the history of doctrines, one that is more or less according to the tenets of evolutionism, right? This, what he's saying right now is that you see different critiques, different forms of attempted scholarship that all end up in some way or another critiquing and abandoning Aquinas, whether this be seeing him as too speculative, right? As you can see in the above uh, section, condemned by Pope Pius IX saying that at the end of the day, uh, you know, the, you know, we're in the modern time, you know, scholasticism was okay in that day, but it's not good for our day. That's a condemned proposition, right? It's condemned by the church, as well as the second one, right? This kind of more Hegelian idealistic evolutionism, uh, where it's uh, seeing all the, the seeing time as divided up into different periods, and each period is progressing to a better and better state, and therefore we should completely and utterly abandon and even oppose any attempt to look back on another state, right? And as you can see with deterministic evolutionism, a change of kinds being the substance of the teachings or of the doctrines change. You see this, right? fundamentally in the root of the the heresy of modernism the idea that dogmas and doctrines can change in their meaning over time this is something that's concerning in even in our own day and age because you see oftentimes many uh, prelates especially in the liberal corners of the church particularly in the german church uh trying to change the church's teaching on issues say of homosexuality of contraception of women's ordination things along that nature uh, even abortion. And at the end of the day, that's the problem is that the substance of a doctrine cannot change from one kind into another. Rather, the substance of a doctrine, right, uh, that was given by our Lord, every doctrine in the uh, deposit of faith given by our Lord proceeds from a implicit truth to an explicit truth in some form or fashion. You can find more information on this. I believe it's on page 320 of the first volume on De, De Revelationis of Father Lagrange. I think I'll do a video on that said subject on uh, proper dogmatic development. I do have one video on uh, on the subject in my uh, critique of the uh, new liturgy series that I'm, I'm working on. However, um, I think it would be a good idea for me to go ahead and do a whole uh, maybe video one day talking about uh, – Father Lagrange's take on uh, the development of doctrine. He says this, according to this view, which is not uh, infrequent today among the systems appearing in the course of time in an appearance with the evolution of ideas, no system is absolutely true, but each is relatively true. That is in opposition uh, to another preceding doctrine or else for some other brief evolutionary period of time. They say that, for instance, Thomism was relatively true in the 13th century in opposition to the doctrine of certain Augustinians, which it surpassed, but it too is not absolutely but relatively false with respect to the subsequent systems, which either as an antithesis or as a superior synthesis of a higher order in the evolution of ideas. Thus, Scoticism, coming at a latter date, would be, a tr would be truer than St. Thomas's doctrine, and this by the movement of the progress of the history of philosophy and theology. Then, why should not this be so for the nominalism of William Wacom? In latter manner, the eclecticism of Suarez of often seeks to steer a middle course between the system of St. Thomas and that of Scotus, would be a still more perfect synthesis at the beginning of a new process or progress among the modern intellectuals. On page 12, he continues and he says, if it were so, nothing would be absolutely true, not even the principle of contradiction, at least as a law of being and higher reason than Hegel admits. All the more so, none of the accepted definitions would be true, would be absolutely true, and hence from none of them would the true properties of things be deduced. There would be only relative truth in its reference to the present state of knowledge, as this rather as regards the already superseded past than the unknown future. Even for the unknowing, the relative truth of any doctrine, it would be necessary to have full knowledge of the preceding periods of evolution, which were the prerequisites of the manifestation of its ultimate development. By way of illustration, we may say that for a knowledge of 
of what ought to be our philosophical conception according to the intellectual exegetes of the 20th century, we would have to go through Kantianism and Hegelianism and then vitally consider Thomism as so to uh, render it truly presentable to modern minds. Yet this new contagion as regards the mental attitude of the 20th century would not be absolutely, but only relatively true, just as in the cognition of St. Thomas was relatively true in the 13th century. He then continues, and now he moves on to the subject of modernism. He says, this conception of truth, however, does not seem to differ from that of the modernist who said, quote, truth is no more immutable, meaning unchangeable, than man himself is in what is it is developed with, in, and by him. So according to the modernist, truth is developed inside of man as opposed to man assenting to a truth coming from an exterior source. And he's foot, footnote number 18 here, right? This is Denzinger again, the old edition, uh, 250, uh, 2058. By this proposition, if we wish to consider the question more seriously, presupposes eminence or absolute evolutionism, according to the theory as Pius IX said in his first proposition of the syllabus, and he's again, this is from 1701, this quotation, Denzinger 1701, quote, in effect, God is produced in man and in the world, and all things are God, and by and have the very substance of God, and God is one. And the same thing as the world, and therefore spirit with matter, necessity with liberty, good with evil, justice with injustice, end quote. This is, again, a condemned proposition, this uh, highlighted quotation, the quotation from the Syllabus of Errors. Indeed, the charge is made against St. Thomas that his method, if it did not differ from Spinoza's, leads to pantheism, and now the new historical method, which is evolutional in its tone of thought. This historical method that he's talking about, you're going to see further on, is more of a the 1940s and 50s ressourcement style of thinking of theology. He says, continuing here, Spinoza indeed identifies all things with the Im Im immobile God, while the evolutionists reduce God to universal evolution. According to the evolutionists, God is really in a process of becoming both in man and in the world, and he never will be in the true sense, as Raman said. Thus, nothing will be absolutely true and nothing absolutely false. There would be only relative truth and relative falsehood. Only relativity would be an absolute, which is in itself somewhat of a contradiction. He says, and above mentioned, confusion between history and philosophy corresponds to the desires neither of the true historian nor of the true philosopher. But the true historian seeks to acquire a knowledge of history from the facts before the uncertain philosophy of history is established. The desire of the true philosopher is, indeed, to acquire an accurate knowledge of philosophy, but he does not consider the temporal sub uh, sequences of truth as, it, as if these were the, cons the criterion or signs of relative truth, and as if the sequence of doctrines were always and necessarily an evolution in the antecedent order but never as a regression or a senile decline. From the fact that Scotus came after St. Thomas, it does not follow that his doctrine is truer, and the latter on where the great perfection of the eclecticism of Suarez. Again, Father Lagrange is really smashing this idea of Hegelianism, essentially, which teaches that if something is more current, then it is more true uh, than anything else. You know, God progresses from better to better to better, until you know you reach this pithy omega point, this ending point. Society progresses better and better until it reaches this pithy omega point, and so does theology. But again, these things are false at the end of the day. God is immutable, and theology at the end of the day does not progress uh, in the context of evolutionism, right, from uh, one substance to a completely different substance, but rather from an implicit seed into an explicit tree, if you will. He says, we must use the historical method in the history of doctrines, and this is indeed the great help in understanding the state and difficulty of the question, so as to give us, as it were, a paranorma of the solutions of any great problem. And that's one reason why we're covering this, right? You need to know the history of theology. But in philosophy, we must employ the analytic and synthetic method proportionate to it. In theology, however, we rely first upon the proofs taken from the authority of Holy Scripture or divine tradition. Uh, or even the writings of the Holy Fathers, and in the second place, the arguments drawn from reason, while, of course, not neglecting the history of problems and their solutions, end quote. All right, so now we're going to switch over, since we've talked a little bit about 
um, uh, the history of Thomism, as well as the history of theology and philosophy. We're going to now move into specifically, oh, and, you know, also covering uh, some of the critiques against Aquinas' method. We're going to continue in that vein of understanding his method, but we're now going to look at it uh, in the sense of how he has underlined it here now on the Aristotelian foundations of St. Thomas's method. This is something that's very important to recognize because I have even seen not so much in the world of scholarly uh, manuscripts as of right now, but I have seen in like a lot of um, discussions with young people who have been reading the writings of St. Thomas recently, that there seems to be a certain trend that uh, wants to say that Aquinas does not have any type of Aristotelian foundation or backing uh, in his belief system, which I don't understand. However, we're going to go ahead and take a look at this. On the Aristotelian foundation of St. Thomas's method, if we consider, however, the works of St. Thomas, we shall see that the common doctor of the church did not despise history, as was the case of uh, with Descartes, but so far as possible in his time, he made use of the history of doctrines, appropriating whatever truth he found in the writings of the ancient philosophers, especially Aristotle, as well as in the works of the fathers and the other doctors of the church. Often, too, with every keen mental perception, St. Thomas has recourse to history of, uh, of errors in formulating his objections, since providence permits errors to be uh, permits errors so that the truth may become more apparent and permits evil so that greater good may result therefrom. This is a beautiful paragraph by St. Thomas. It reveals two beautiful things. One, Aquinas goes back to sources, right? He goes back and studies both the theological truths, whether they're contained in scripture, the fathers, the doctors, etc. Then he examines the errors, the theological and philosophical errors, these errors that God permits only so that truth may become more apparent, just as he permits evil so that greater good can result therefrom. If we consider the general structure of St. Thomas's articles, so the articles in the Summa, we, de we detect in it a scientific application of method, which the angelic doctor has previously discussed at length in his commentary on Aristotle's posterior analytics. This work of Aristotle's treats of the search for real definition of the division of the genus and in the inductive and comparative inquiry into specific differences. Difference. It also discusses a priori and posteriori demonstrations and especially the middle term in demonstration. All these things we'll get a little bit more into later in this video. Some modern writers say that the structure of the theological summe is artificial in the case of the electic syncretism in which heterogeneous elements are mechanically and, as it were, accidentally joined together. However, it is not only all the commentators of the angelic doctrine, but many contemporary historians, and then he lays out an example of his own day, Father Grimbaman, uh, points out that the theological summa, from beginning to end, constitutes one organic whole. This is very important to recognize, that it is one organic whole. The orderly arrangement of the three parts containing 38 treatises, about 3,000 articles, almost 10,000 objections, is affected with superb constructive skill. Right? This is a, a work of the theological science. This is what the Summa is. Furthermore, the divisions are not accidental, but have their foundations in the very nature of things. Notwithstanding so great a complexity of questions, the whole doctrinal ed uh, edifice, as, as it is well called is simple in the magnitude like the Egyptian pyramids or the Gothic cathedrals, not even one column of which can be changed without destroying the perfect harmony of the edifice. But what is the foundation of this method of doctrinal construction? These are questions that he asked. So he first outlines the truth that this is a theological science with all these statistics up here. But then at the same time, what is the foundation of this method? A closer inspection of this architecture attention must be drawn to the general way in which the articles are composed in accordance with the technique of scholastic exposition to which St. Thomas adheres as he didactically proceeds in the Summa Theologica and Questionis Dispute. In uh, but he dispensed himself from this obscal and in the Sumer Contradentilis, where he often juxtaposed arguments at the reader's choice, not explicitly distinguishing between direct and indirect arguments, or between those derived from proper and those from common principles. This art or technique that he's using and employing in the Summa, which 
some seem uh, some seem too conventional, truly corresponds to the normal progress of the intellect in the philosophical and theological investigation of truth. Why in the Summa Theologica do we always find at the beginning of each article three objections, which are introduced by the formula ventur quod non? Why does an article in the Questiones Fiutate often begin with ten objections against one part of the con uh, of of the contradiction and 10 or 12 against the other. To some, it seems that these objections should follow the demonstration of truth. On the contrary, according to Aristotle's method and that of almost all the doctors, in the beginning there must be a statement of question and of what is essentially the point at issue in the difficulty to be solved. It is about this that the metho methodological doubt is chiefly concerned, and the Stagrit spoke it long before Descartes, and with shrewd judgment too, not by doubting the validity of the principles of reason, but by solving the objection of skeptics. The necessity of this methodical doubt is well known by St. Thomas. Aristotle says, with a view to the science which we are investigating, we must first approach the subject about which it behooves us to first raise doubts. The difficult to be solved must be examined, right? And you can see this is a quotation, quotation number uh, 22. Concerning this, the angelic doctor says, quote, just as he who wishes to free himself from the chain of that that binds him must first inspect the chain and the way it binds him. So he who wishes to solve a doubt must first examine all the difficulties and their causes. Those who wish to search for truth not taking doubt first into consideration, are like those who do not know where they are going. Hence, they cannot go by a direct route unless perhaps they do so by chance, nor can they know when they find the truth sought and when they do not. Just as in judgment, no one can give a decision unless he hears the reasons for and against. So he who has to examine philosophical questions is necessarily in a better position to judge if he has informed himself of practically all the reasons for the doubts raised by the adversaries. On account of these reasons, it was Aristotle's custom in almost all his works to prepare for the search or determination of truth by renouncing the doubt by recounting the doubts raised against it. In this, the philosopher the philosopher's critical spirit manifests itself, for it is a matter of little importance for some to be well aware of the nature of the difficulty to be solved. Such must be the method of procedure, at least for the procedure of fundamental questions. Others, the true difficulty of the problem sometimes remains almost unknown, even to the very end of the thesis, or else it receives but a passing comment to the last objection. The statement and the difficulty of the question to be solved are made manifest by the opposite opposite solutions that have already been given by the predecessors or by the opposing arguments for and against the thesis. This was Aristotle's method of procedure, and St. Thomas followed him, especially in his Questiones Disputate, in which first he sets forth the opposition, so to say, between thesis and antithesis, between mind being fully aware and of nature, of being difficult to be solved before the procedure to be developed of the superior synthesis. This and this is part of the truth contained in the Hegelian method, which Hegel, Hegel did not retain in its pur purity of form. Thus, the hearers do not let the merits of their case consist in the solutions or accidental difficulties, nor do they ask useless questions which abstract the mind from the main point of the issue, but at once they go to the very root of the difficulty. Thus, the thesis must be elaborated in harmony with the teaching of St. Thomas, and what is, and that is why they are enunciated in the form of the question by means of the particle, quote, whether, end quote, and not in the form of a positive statement for the completion, for the complete solution to be found only at the end. And often many propositions are required so as fully to express the meaning. In the Summa Theologiae, because St. Thomas proceeds with with more brevity of distinction than in the questiones disputete, there are only three principal objections. Sometimes they are most striking gems, and, uh, and in opposition to these, there is the counterargument which generally is taken from authority. St. Thomas does not develop these arguments from authority, but gives only one in each case, sometimes 
expressed in very few words because he presupposes that 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 it was already said by him in his commentaries on the holy scriptures especially in the epistles and gospels and also from his kunja area which is his famous four volume uh commentary from the father's exegete on holy scripture Evidently, in our days, these arguments from authority, especially on dogmatic subjects, must be developed so that whatever is declared by the church must have a, pro a proximate rule of faith, whether it may be clearly and explicitly known, and what is the foundation of this both in scripture and in tradition. The body of this article is variously constructed in accordance with the different questions to be solved. But as the angelic doctor explains elsewhere, there are four scientific questions. First, whether a thing is, for instance, whether God is. Two, what is uh, what he is. Three, whether he is such by nature or, in, for instance, whether he be free. And four, for what purpose he is such, for instance, for what purpose or why he is free? These four questions are evidently different in nature, notwithstanding the identity of the classical formula in the Summa Theologica, whether this is dot dot dot, end quote. The question whether a thing is, is, is presupposes that it means a name or the nominal definition, that is, what the name of the thing means according to the conventional use. This leads up to the question about which the thing is, just as the third question, whether a thing is of such a nature, leads up to the fourth, or what purpose it is of such nature. In all these questions, as Aristotle said, the middle term is the demonstration must be the subject of the special consideration. When the argumentative part of the article answers this question, whether a thing is, for instance, whether God is, then the angelic doctor says it is necessary to accept as the middle term, the meaning of the word, end quote. For instance, his name, God, that this, the name God, means first uncaused cause, and first uncaused cause exists, for everything that comes into being has a cause, and there is no process to infinity in directly subordinated causes. Therefore, God exists. It must especially be taken into consideration how St. Thomas answers the question about the quiddity and purpose of things. So now we move on to the inductive search for definitions, Aquinas' inductive search. He says, Paul Lagrange says, but when it is asked what a thing is, for instance, what is the human soul? What is charity or faith? It is a question of seeking for a real definition in accordance with laws laid down by Aristotle in one of his works. And you can see Posteriori Analytics, book two, chapter eight, lectures seven and eight in uh, footnote number 27, in which it is shown that the meaning of a definition cannot be demonstrated unless there are two definitions of the same thing, one of which obtained by means of final or efficient causality contains the reason for which of the other, namely the essential definition. Thus, the circle and its cir circumference is defined as a figure Every point, of which, every point of which circumference is equally distant from the center because it is formed by the revolution of a straight line found in one of the extremities. But with the exception of these cases, the definition cannot be demonstrated either a posteriori, as the existence of a cause can be demonstrated from its effects, or a, a priori by the pro property is deduced from the ex from the essence. For the definition of a thing is the very means by which its properties are demonstrated, nor are there any processes to infinity in this. But if the real definition cannot be demonstrated, it is to be sought for by beginning with the nominal and conventional definition, which determines only what is the subject of discussion. The transmission from the nominal to the real word the essential definition is affected as shown in the same work to be quoted, and you can see quotation number 28, by the gradual process of the division of the genera from the highest to the lowest and by the, the inductive ascent to the, to the specific difference from a comparison of similar or dissimilar things, end quote. See here in foot, quote, footnote 29, he says, in this way, Aristotle attained to the division of motion inasmuch as it has reference to being and is to be the division of being into potency, into potency and act. Thus, motion becomes intelligible since it is reduced to being, 
which is the object of the intellect. Whereas contrary to this, Descartes' letters in Principles uh, 225 define motion in reference to the rest or cessation of motion. And from this, no philosophical or intelligible idea of motion is obtained. By the same method, Aristotle defined the soul, the faculties, wisdom, knowledge, prudence, art, and the various virtues and other things, end quote. He continues, this method of finding definitions that truly expresses the reality and essence of things is most admirably retained by St. Thomas. While several modern authors write uh, at the beginning proposed definitions that are that are of some times very complex, as if they had received them by revelation, often not saying how they obtain them, St. Thomas at the beginning of each treatise inquires throughout several articles into the definition of a thing in question. For instance, the definition of charity as being a friendship between God and man, and also a special and most sublime virtue. He also inquires into the definition of the four kinds of justice, equalizing legal, distributive, communicate, communicative into the definition of prudence, and so on. In these articles, there is no inquiry into the middle term of the demonstration, since the quest of the definition is not demonstration. But in the inductive inquiry, the holy doctors often adduce the most appropriate observations as Father Simeon Depologue observed. For instance, in the case of social matters, thus the transition is made gradually from natural reason to common sense of mankind to philosophical reason. And as you can see here, it's footnote number 30, right? It's kind of an extensive uh, footnote right here, which if you'd like, you can go ahead and pause the video and read this footnote, again, footnote number 30, if you would like for your leisure. He continues, this search for the definition is evident is evidently of great importance for all the demonstration of the properties of anything having their foundation in the its definition it is like a manner the direct division of any whole rests upon its definition. Even universal principles are derived from rightly constituted or interconnected primarily notions, and these principles in the metaphysical order are in the very case Thus, St. Thomas, with profound penetration of thought, wills from the very definition of will, the ob object of which is good. This latter being formally not in the mind, but in the things themselves. He says, the will is directed to the things as they are in themselves, and in themselves they exist under particular qualifications here and now. Hence, we will a thing simply inasmuch as we will it in all particular circumstances are considered, and this is what is meant by willing consequently, end quote. And again, you can see footnote number 31, he's quoting from St. Thomas Summa, part one, question 19, article six, etc. On the other hand, as stated in the same article, we will, uh, we will some good antecedently, as long as we will it when all particular circumstances are not considered, but according to the absolute good of itself. And this is to will it in a qualified manner, not simply. From these de definitions thus established, St. Thomas deduces the same article, his most universal principle, quote, thus it is clear that whatever God simply wills t takes place, although what he wills antecedently may not take place. But this double pre uh, proposition virtually contains the whole teaching of St. Thomas about the efficacious grace. If indeed the above stated definition of the of the consequence and antecedent wills have metaphysical validity, the same must be said of the principles that has its foundations in them. Then not even the least good act and most easy of the performance right of the movement happens as dependent solely upon God's antecedent will or without a decree of his consequential will, and the causality of which is infallib infallible, although it most admirably preserves intact human liberty. For as just stated, quote, whatever God simply wills takes place, although what he wills antecedently may not take his place. If any good happens, then most easy to perform right at the moment, where to happen without such a decree, for the consequential will, when the principle enunciated by St. Thomas would no longer be physically true, and this would mean that the complete renunciation of his doctrine according to God's foreknowledge and the consequent will. If this principle were of no metaphysical vitality, uh, 
it would amount to nothing more than the saying of a solitary act of the majority of cases do not take place unless they had been consequently willed by God or, in another place, words, the universal uh, ordainer did not ordain all good things, but only very many. This doctrine would be of no value, whether philosophically or theologically, but the principles that have been related in this order are not metaphysically and universally or in every case true unless they have their foundation in due or correct definition or of subject. In this, we clearly see the importance of searching for real definitions. All right, now to get to his middle term in demonstration, this is going to also help us in understanding the proper methodology that Aquinas is laying out. For those of you who do not know what the middle term is, it is a philosophical term that you should hopefully be somewhat familiar with. The term is the commonplace between both places of a syllogism. He says, from the article, however, in which the method methodological inquiry is instituted as the real definition of anything, we must distinguish the otherwise uh, and otherwise explain those in which St. Thomas solves the question, whether a thing is of such a nature, and often he solves as one question the composite. For what purpose is it of such a nature? Example of such are, quote, when he asks whether the human soul is incorruptible, that is, whether and for what purpose is the incorruptible, whether man is free, whether faith is most certain, whether it belongs to God alone to create, or whether and for what purpose Christ's passion was the cause of our salvation by way of merit, and other similar questions. In these cases, the solution of the question uh, for the purpose refers to true and indeed uh, a priori demonstration, nor does it mean one derived from common but from proper principles. Hence, in the last mentioned articles, that are strictly demonstrative, whether they be whether they are deduced from reason alone or from faith and reason, a special inquiry must be made into the middle term of demonstration, which is, as it were, the golden key of the article. So this is important, as you can see. The title of the article is given the two terms of the conclusion, namely the minor and the major term, right? The middle term must be assigned by which the other two can be united in a scientific conclusion, and this term assigns, quote, why a thing is and cannot otherwise than it is. It is the very Aristotelian definition of scientific knowledge, end quote, right? And you can see this is from footnote number 32. comes in um, Aristotle's posterior analytics. Sometimes, however, in the comparison of the body of the articles, St. Thomas begins with the major and through the minor descends into the conclusion, so that the argument is easily presented in scholastic form as to make it clear what is the middle term in the demonstration. Thus, the question whether the human soul is incorruptible, the argument may be condensed into the following syllogism. Every simple and substant form is absolutely incorruptible, but the human soul is a is a simple and substantial form. Therefore, the human soul is incorruptible. Likewise, in the question whether it belongs to God alone to create, the argument may be reduced to this syllogism. The most universal effects must be reduced to the most universal and first cause of what is God. Now, being itself, which is absolutely produced in creation, is the most universal of effects. Therefore, to produce a being absolutely not as this, or as that being to create belongs to God alone. Often, too, St. Thomas begins with the, with the minor in the subject which is already given in the title and will appear again in the subject of the conclusion. Thus, by the mirror, he ascends from subject on the title to the middle term in demonstration. Afterwards, he enunciates the major, its subjects being the simple middle term. It, it predicates being the major term or the title which is the conclusion, must be joined to the minor term. Thus often the process of proof in the articles is by the ascent from the minor to the middle term in the demonstration and by the descent from the major to the conclusion. We have an example of this in the question, whether any created good constitutes man's happiness. St. Thomas replies by enunciating the first major. Happiness is the perfect good, completely lewing the rational appetite which is specified by the universal good. Now the perfect good, which is completely, which completely lulls the rational appetite, is specified by universal good, cannot be anything created or limited. 
Therefore, man's happiness cannot consist in any created good. This is something that I very much so love in Aquinas' thought as well as Father Lagrange expressing this. This reality of God being our only, uh, the only good that we can really truly be fulfilled in, that no created good can fulfill that. He continues, if we wish to present the argument in a syllogistic form, the major must be enun uh, enunciated first. In the, gener in the generality of cases, by retaining the first propositions of St. Thomas, the argument can be reduced to scholastic form. It is better, however, to keep the doctor's own terms than to change them as to follow an excessive logistical formalism, logical formalism. Finally, the major or minor must be defended against the attacks made upon it by the opponents of St. Thomas. In the explanation of the body of this of the article, the middle term, the demonstration, must be the subject of diligent inquiry, or if there are several subordinated middle terms, evidently we must we must concentrate our attention upon the principal ones. The reason is that, as St. Thomas often remarks, the conclusions are known materially, but the middle terms in the demonstration are the formal cause of our knowledge, and by these the conclusions are known. Thus it is known formally for what purpose a thing is and of such nature, for instance, why man is free, or because he is knowledge, he has knowledge of a universal good, that his attitude towards the particular good is one of uh, dominating. For again, why man is a social being is because of the requirements of the specific act which are known to the things which he needs to know because his first limited intelligence he needs the assistance of others thus there is only one formal or proximate middle term which the definition of a thing is and its uh, essence from which the first property is to be deduced from which the first property of the one property is to be deduced and from the first property of one subordinate to this and so on in the ascending form nevertheless anything that has already been demonstrated directly and form the properties of this thing by means of the formal cause can still be demonstrated in other ways, for instance, by means of property and final cause, or even from the common principles or indirectly, whether by the significance or if by the method of reduction to the absurdity. Thus, St. Thomas in the book of the Contra Gentiles makes use of these directly for or indirect arguments so as to reach the same conclusion and places them together not giving the reason why there are six or ten in number but the summa theologica and questione disputate there is usually one only one direct argument which is the formal uh, kind and is deduced from the properties of a thing introducing the, co the approximately formal middle term or if the holy doctor gives two or three uh, arguments, he assigns the scientific reason why and how there are two and three methods of argumentation. Therefore, the middle term in demonstration must be clearly presented, which is the syllogism of the first figure is the subject of a major and the predicate of the minor. And we know that the modes of the other figures can be reduced to the modes of the first figure. Therefore, this middle term, thus clearly stated, presents itself as a keystone of the article, inserted in the syllogism as a precious jewel set in a ring. Thus, we make use of logic, not indeed for its own sake, but that by it we may acquire a direct knowledge for the middle term, for principle, for which the truth of the conclusion must be considered, or at least of the main con conclusion. If there are several conclusions in the article, as sometimes happens, having accomplished this task to commit to memory, what is of the first importance of this article? It is enough to bear in mind that the middle term, when the question is again posted, the major and minor terms are included in it. Hence, in replying to the question, it suffices to communicate the middle term in the demonstration so that again we may have the demonstration of the conclusion. An illustration of this, let us take the question whether the human soul is incorruptible. It suffices to reply to this, every simple and substantial form, therefore the human soul is incorruptible. In the middle term, in the demonstration of the article, it is thus carefully taken into consideration. This makes us see more clearly, without the aid of syllogisms, the solutions of the objects which 
were present uh, presented in the beginning of the article. As a matter of fact, St. Thomas casts upon the solutions of the object in the, in the searchlight of the middle term in the demonstration. And by means of this light, the demonstration is to be made, it is easily discovered and understood. After this, whatever doubts the corollaries may be, these can be properly presented. This method was often adopted by the Salamistians. The stand taken by St. Thomas is properly understood, is seen to be the just mean and summit between and above two extremes. On the one hand, empiric nominalism, which results a certain objectivity of experience, though denying the necessity of the universality of knowledge. And on the other hand, an idealism of conceptuals and subjectivists, which retains a certain necessary and individual knowledge, although without any ontological validity, that is, without any true objectivity. St. Thomas's method of procedure in the construction of this article is far more inaccurate than the natural progress of the mind in its search for truth than in the method adopted by several scholastics of the latter day, who in the beginning multiply the primary remarks without those things which have already been explained by them, and that you do not need any further explanation. Often also these materials juxtapose the various preliminary remarks, not showing the essential relation between them, and then they purpose the argument in a um, in the briefest manner, so that the middle term in the art in the demonstration is not sufficiently clear, and sometimes several arguments in succession are proposed, in which the direct formal argumentation abducted from the properties of a thing is not sufficiently demonstrated from the others. For from those derived from the common principles or from the indirect arguments, this latter method is rather mechanical, whereas the method of St. Thomas is organic, according to the natural pro process of the mind in operation. Lastly, the importance of the middle term is demonstration is clearly perceived from the rules to be observed in scholastic disputations or arguments. The objector is uh, in accordance with these rules by clever argumentation so as to overthrow the conclusions must attack the three successive objections in scholastic form the middle term in the demonstration which is so to speak the chief point of attack uh, to be de defended in the way as it were the citadel of the objector of the defender but the defender of this citadel must train upon the objector the light of the middle term in the form of brilliant distinctions that is not accidentally but directly and truly to be the point. Thus, after a well-ordered scholastic demonstration, which is of reasonable difficulty, the truth of the article, having been sifted and freed from all its difficulties, becomes increasingly clear and the searching confirmed by the austere criticism, which is, as it were, the acid that attacks the metals, gold alone excepted. All right, so that's probably the most heady section of this introduction that we're going to be going through. But suffice to say, I think a lot of this can be summed up very much so in his uh, distinction down here. Uh, in this paragraph right here that begins with a, uh, the stand taken by St. Thomas. Aquinas is avoiding two major extremes in the way that he is outlining his summa, as also as in the way of his method and middle term, avoiding both on the one hand empiric nominalism, right, and then also conceptualists and subjectivists on the other extreme. Now moving on, he moves into on the perfect union of analysis and synthesis in the angelic doctor's method. This is actually going to lead into, uh, in my opinion, the most interesting portion of this introduction. Uh, the portion which is talking about how all of this knowledge of Aquinas flows from his place of contemplation, his place of prayer, his place of deep reflection. So we're going to go ahead and get into that uh, in, in a bit. But he now begins and he says, in this way, or on the perfect union of analysis and synthesis in the angelic doctor's method, in this way, St. Thomas perfectly observes the rules of method in general, namely by always beginning from the more known by proceeding gradually and not jumping from uh, to the conclusion. He never reaches the more remote conclusions before the immediate conclusions are known with certainty. Thus, the conclusions between them is clearly perceived, and all the conclusions make up a truly organic body of doctrine. In like manner, he perfectly applied to the rules of analytic method in the order of finding, especially so in the direct and not accidental divisions, 
of the complex subject uh, to be considered until he reaches the transcendental notions and first principles. Thus, after carefully considering the parts, he arrives at a correct judgment of the whole. He likewise most assured uh, adroitly makes use of the analytic method in the inductive and comparative inquiry into the specific difference of things so as to differ from the distinct real definitions contained in the confused manner in the nominal ones. With the equal degree of perfection he employed in the synthetic method uh, in his doctrine, both in the questions to be proposed and, all, and in the manner of solving them. For in questions, for imposing the questions, he always begins from the more universal and gradually descends into the less universal, from the essence to be uh, to the properties, from causes to effects. Likewise, in solving the questions, he always starts from principles, whether revealed or directly known or derived from experience, and from the definitions of things in question. Nor does he depart from the certain principles because of the obscurity of the mystery to which the principles lead, as in the case of the questions on grace and free will. Hence, he, hence we may say that the elements of truth contained in the rules of the method, as formulated by Descartes, was already perfectly known by the angelic doctor. Thus, the theological summa is splendid and is a splendid example of the synthetic method in the orderly arrangement of the theological knowledge. It first treats of God's existence and of his nature, and then of his attributes. In the third place, the three persons, fourthly, of God's actions at extra, and so on for the rest. In this orderly arrangement, everyone can see that St. Thomas far surpasses the master of the sentences, being Peter Lombard, who treats but indirectly of moral theology, distinguishing faith, hope, and charity on the occasion of the following question, whether Christ had faith, hope, and charity, and treating of sin in general when the question of original sin presents itself. Finally, this must especially be noted. We noticed the angelic uh, doctor succeeded exceedingly well in combining analysis and synthesis according to the sentence analysis, which terminates in principles and causes in the principle of descendant analysis. For analysis, having finished with natural philosophy in ontology, extends to consider the notions of analysis being act and potency, as also the universal principle of reason and being, which immune from whole synthesis in general metaphysics. After this, the mind ascends into considered pure act, the supreme being, which is required in the final analysis, the true notion of which is, as it were, the sun of all synthesis in the universality of the scope, which is knowledge of all things inasmuch as they are beings. By no means do we find in the system of St. Thomas, this abuse of a a priori method, which is clearly seen in the works of Spinoza and, and the final cause, and hence leads to rationalism and pantheonism, as if in all things could be deduced from God's nature in a geometric way. By way of investigation and analysis, St. Thomas ascends by the light of the first principles of reason and sensible things and the most certain way and the most certain facts of experience to the supreme and most universal cause who since he is infinitely perfect and in no way stands in need of creatures created all things with absolute freedom then by the way of of synthesis the holy doctor judges of all things by means of a lofty principle he himself says by way of judgment from eternal things already known we judge of temporal things and in according According to laws of things eternal, we dispose of temporal things. In accordance with this union of analysis and synthesis presented by the angelic doctor, as Father de Rodaro shows, the supreme truth of Christian philosophy in which the analytic method or method of finding in the ascending order terminates, and which is the principle of synthetic method of judgment, is this, God is the self-subsisting being, I am who I am. In other words, only in God are essence and existence identical. This is the golden key of the whole doctrinal edifice. It is constructed by the angelic doctor with such penetration or thought and fixity of principles that Leo XIII testified no one uh, surpassed him in this. Avoiding both nominalism, which denies the objectivity of metaphysics, reducing it to logic, and the extreme realism of Plato, which on no just grounds considers the universe 
uh, universal to exist formally apart from things, St. Thomas admirably distinguished between logic and metaphysics, between logical and real being. He clearly shows that being, our mind, considered the question the essence of, of anything finite. Being is not of existence, and hence only in God are essence and existence identical. This is the culminating point of the five proofs for God's existence. The termination, uh, the terminus of the ascending order by the method of finding and in the principle of judgment from the highest cause of the synthetic method. For many years, the more we have studied the theological summa, the more we have seen the beauty of this structure. The exposition and demonstrations are simple and clear, especially if they are compared with the commentaries on the sentences of Peter Lombard, the superfluous questions being avoided in accordance with the angelic doctor's plan as stated in the prologue. This we talked a little bit about last week or in the last lecture. Likewise, repetitions are eliminated as much as possible because subjects are always treated in a general way before they are received special consideration. And St. Thomas does not refer his readers to what is uh, to be said later on. In this simplicity and clarity, the angelic doctor evidently far surpasses not only his predecessors, but even Scotus and Suarez. The perfection of this edifice is in a great part due to the uh, consummate skill with which he affects the divisions between the treatises or the questions or the articles of the arguments. This division, of course, are not ex extrinsic but intrinsic arranged in accordance with the formal point of view of the whole to be divided and affected by means of members that are truly opposite to each other so that the divisions are adequate with subordinate subdivisions. Yet yeah, all is done with discretion and not, not only by descending to the last details. Thus, by a gradual process, the light of the principles reached to the ultimate conclusion that are nevertheless still universal. Perspective knowledge does not descend from the particular and thus is, essential, is essentially distinct from the experience and the and prudent. All right, so now we get into my favorite section. The doctrine of St. Thomas proceeds from the fullness of his contemplation. In addition to these considerations, we must finally say that the angelic doctor never cherished method more for its own sake, but for the purpose of finding out the truth of transmitting it to posterity, especially divine truth to which he especially directed his attention. On the contrary, just as many hunters find great delight in the sport of hunting than in the game they take, so some evidently have in mind the mode of demonstrating the truth rather than actually discovering the, the actual discovery of the truth itself, even while they are investigating things most sublime, such as the infinite value of Christ's merits for the divine processions. This is a deform, deformation of the theologian's profession when he is not sufficiently con contemplative. He then discresses too much and is too much given to argumentation. This is something that we, especially online, can take a huge, huge pause and recognize that if we are spending most of our time in trying to understand systems and argumenting too much as opposed to not having sufficient contemplation, then we're in a really uh, big, big problem. Nevertheless, in the hours of study, we must give careful consideration to the proper method, which, as we acquire the habit, we unconsciously make use of little by little, as if the case with the musician who is, pra who is practicing to play on the guitar or the harp. Thus, the difficulty gradually acquired in the use of proper method disposes a person for a correct knowledge of the different parts of philosophy and theology, and by this the very fact for the con contemplation of the truth from which proceeds the living doctrine that eliminates the minds and inflames the hearts. The angelic doctor says that this that doctrine and preaching must proceed from the fullness of contemplation, end quote. It was so then he taught, just as only those musicians make good use of their method who, under the influence of a certain inspiration, fully penetrate the soul of a symphony, so St. Thomas employed his scientific method, inspired as it were from above, illuminated by the light of uh, vivid faith and of the gifts of the Holy Ghost, and this light absolutely transcends all the systems and all knowledge acquired by human efforts.
Thus, only by this supernatural light does theology attain its end. And when we find ver uh, verified in the words of the Vatican Council, quote, reason finds enlightened, reason indeed enlightened by faith, then it, uh, when it seeks earnestly, piously, and calmly, attains a gift from God some, and that a very fruitful considering of mysteries. But reason never becomes culpable of apprehend of of apprehending mysteries as it does those truths which constitutes its proper object. For in this mortal life we are pilgrims, not yet with God. We walk by faith and not by sight. End quote. Therefore, Saint Thomas, before he dedicated, or wrote, or preached, used to recite this prayer. Quote, Ineffable Creator, who out of the treasures of thy wisdom hast appointed three hierarchies of angels and set them in admirable order over the, uh, of order high above the heavens and has disposed the diverse proportions of the universe in such marvelous array, thou who art called the true source of light and the supreme supermanent principle of wisdom, be pleased to cast to a beam thy radiance upon the darkness of my mind and dispel from me the double darkness of sin and ignorance in which I have been born. Thou who makest eloquent the tongues of little children, fashion my words and pour upon my lips the grace of thy benediction. Grant my presentation to uh, presentation to understand, capacity to retain, method and facility in study, subtlety in interpretation, and abundance, grace, and expression. Order the beginning and direct the progress and, the, and perfect the achievement of my works. Thou who art true God and man, and livest and reignest forever and ever. Amen. End quote. This prayer was heard for the Holy Doctor's work on the logical method is to be seen in light of the gifts of the Holy Ghost, as also the gratuitously given the grace of the word of wisdom, as Pope Pius XI says. Therefore, in a certain responsory of the office for the Feast of St. Thomas, we read, quote, There is brevity of style, a pleasing eloquence, sublimity, charity, and well-founded opinion, end quote. There is sublimity because the knowledge is derived from the highest causes, from the highest causes. There is clarity because by the light of the highest principle, he penetrates to the very source of the question. There is well-founded opinion because, quote, he assigns the cause why the thing is and cannot otherwise than it is, end quote, according to Aristotelian definition of knowledge. This pleasing eloquence coupled with a brevity of style is the result of a vivid and supernatural contemplation by which the holy doctor was conversant, not with the literal, but also with the spiritual interpretation of holy scripture. He knew to be sure that, especially for the discussion of divine subjects, Prayer and contemplation were no less necessary than laborious efforts in the pursuit of knowledge. And then the difficulties arose. He did not pray less so as to give himself more time to study, but in preference to this, he spent more time in prayer. This truth is of great importance for renewing the spirit of study in theology, so, it, it, so that it may be something vital and productive of its due effects. Concerning the holy doctor's contemplation, Pope Pius XI wrote as follows, quote, the more readily to obtain these illuminations from above, he would often abstain from food, spend whole nights in prayerful vigil, and surrendering to a holy impulse would repeatedly lean his head against the tabernacle and would constantly turn his eyes with sorrow and love toward the image of Jesus crucified. To his friend St. Bonaventure, he confided with what Ever he knew, he had for the most part learned from the book of the crucifix. End quote. One of my favorite quotes about St. Thomas Aquinas. It's such a beautiful reality. And it's this reality that we need to, especially as people who are wanting to understand the Catholic faith more, spend more time in prayer and let that lead us into study. Christ indeed had said, quote, The words that I get have spoken to you are spirit and life. End quote. Of course, books give us the letter, but study without prayer in the interior life does not attain to the spiritual meaning. Whosoever considers the light of divine contemplation from which the greater synthesis of St. Thomas proceeds cannot say that this doctrine is extreme intellectualism, devoid of reality, and lifeless. But 
by an intellectual process as befitting a science and not according to the tenets of sentimentalism. St. Thomas treats of God our natural and supernatural states, but he never separates our intellectual life from the influence of the exerted uh, from influence exerted upon it by the will or even by the sensitive faculties, for he shows to our complete satisfaction the mutual relations between these faculties. He says, indeed, quote, if therefore the intellect and the will be considered with regard to themselves, then the intellect is the higher power, for the object of the intellect is simpler, more absolute than the object of the will, end quote. Being, a, being is prior to and more universal than good, Thus, the intellect is simpler and higher than the will, which directs. Yet the holy doctor adds, quote, but relatively and by comparison with something else, we find that the will is sometimes higher than the intellect. Thus, the love of God, at least in this life, is better than the knowledge of God, end quote. The reason is that the intellect draws itself, draws to itself the thing understood by even through the even though this is superior to it, whereas the will is drawn to the thing, thus charity is the most excellent of the virtues. St. Thomas also says, quote, some are, are hearers that they may know, and these build upon the intellect only and not upon charity, and this is, the, and this is building upon sand, end quote. This is the real reality of the fact, my friends, that we need to be building upon charity. This doctrine is not, indeed, extreme intellectualism. Concerning all these things, St. Thomas speaks not orically, but scientifically, as befitting his scope, which is, in, which is the search not for the beauty that attracts as a poetic art, but for the truth, without which there cannot be any true, any true goodness or beauty. St. Thomas excludes the particular from the knowledge of, in the strict sense, since nothing in knowledge except by way of abstraction from individualizations matters. He certainly affirms that the knowledge of singulars does not pertain to the perfections of the intellectual, intellective soul in speculative knowledge, but he adds immediately that it is pertains to the perfection of the same practical knowledge, namely of uh, prudence and the gift of counsel, it pertains also to either external or internal experience, which the angelic doctor certainly did not despise. He even asserts that the just person can have a gift of wisdom, a, quote, quasi-experimental knowledge, end quote, of the presence of God in the soul and of the mystery mysteries of salvation, according to the following text of St. Paul, quote, for the Spirit himself giveth testimony to our spirit that we are the sons of God, and gives, his, gives this testimony through the, quote, effect of filial love which God pro produces in us, end quote. The holy doctor possessed this mystery, this mystic experience of the highest degree, and it certainly influenced the construction of his theological synthesis, but as it were, from the high, from on high, by conforming and inducing his faith. The knowledge in a strict sense, whether philosophical or theological, which is acquired by study, is essentially distinct from any individual experience, whatever even the most sublime, and is considered only with universals, whether predictions or beings or causations. But the universal is in prediction is fundamentally in individual things, and expresses what is necessary and negatively uh, eternal in them, namely what is true not only here and now but always. It is the begin. It is the being, which is it is the being what is was intended to be. Therefore, the holy doctor says, quote, "So far as universals taken as logical entities are concerned, so far as they are the case for knowledge and demonstration." They are more truly beings than particulars are, because the former and the incorruptible, whereas the latter are not. But as regards natural substance, particulars are more truly beings, because they are called first and principal substances. Thus, reality is perceived absolutely intact. Hence, in scientific knowledge, and rightly so, St. Thomas reduces all things to universal principles as our fundamental, necessary, and perpetual laws, not only of the mind, but also being, and of being whether natural or supernatural. Thus, his method is of great help in remedying the defects of modern philosophy, in which the distinction between the internal senses and the intellect between nature and grace gradually disappear. With the elimination of ontological validity from the first principles of reason, 
there is nothing firm and stable left in speculative order and an a for ortai in the practical order the theological summa of saint thomas constructed as it is according to the above mentioned method since it avoids opposite extremes of rationalism and fideism is a work that is both truly scientific and always elucid by the light of the supernatural revelation it is therefore truly a classical and perennial work not indeed of extreme intellectualism but of sacred theology that has been raised to the status of a true science notwithstanding the obscurity of faith it constitutes a really organic body of doctrine and it is truly a single science to subordinate to god's knowledge and to what and to which the blessed have in him and bears as it were the stamp in us of the divine science considering all things under the formality of god as author of grace and as the ultimate end now we examine the relation between study of theology and the interior life and i like the distinction that saint thomas makes here he avoids, again, two large extremes when it comes to the spiritual life that you see um, were common in his day, common in Father Lagrange's day, common in all times. It's very much so common in our own day and experience. The relation between study of theology and the interior life. There is often too great a separation between the study and the interior life. We do not su find sufficiently observed that beautiful gradation spoken by St. Benedict, which consists in reading, cognition, study, meditation, prayer, and contemplation. St. Thomas, who received his first education from the Benedictines, retains this wonderful gradation when speaking of the contemplative life. Several defects result from uh, separating study too much from prayer. Thus, the hardship and difficulty that is not infrequent accompanying study are no longer considered a solitary penance, nor are they sufficiently directed to God. Thus, weariness and disgust sometimes result from study without any spiritual profit. St. Thomas speaks about these two uh, deviations when discussing the virtue of studiousness or application to study, which must be commanded by charity as a check to inordinate curiosity and sloth, so as to study those things which one ought to study, how, when, and where one ought, especially with regard to the supernatural end in view, this being for the acquisition of better knowledge of God and for the salvation of souls. This is such a beautiful, wonderful section, recognizing that, again, number one, St. Thomas places study inside of the proper limits that it's supposed to be in. And rather than making study just a solitary penance or something that can bring about disgust or weariness, we ought to apply proper properly the virtue of studiousness to help us follow after the lord's will in our own life avoid the above mentioned defects that are opposed to each other it is good to recall how our intellectual study can be sanctified by considering first what benefit the interior life receives from a study that is properly directed and then on the other hand what the study of theology can hope to receive in the increasing degree from the interior life it is in the union of these two foundations of our natures that we find the best verification of the principles quote causes mutually interact but in a different order end quote there is a mutual causality and pri priority among them which is truly wonderful indebtedness of the interior life to study by the study of theology the inner life is especially preserved from two serious defects of subjectivism and piety and of particularism subjectivism as it applies to piety, is often called sentimentalism, end quote. It consists in a certain uh, effaced love which lacks a true and deep love for God and souls. This defect arises from the fact that the natural inclination for our sensitive nature prevails in prayer according to each one's disposition. An emotion for our sensitive nature prevails, and this emotion sometimes expresses itself in certain outbursts which praise which uh, uh, outbursts of praise, which are quite without solid foundation in reality. Our days, in our days, several psychologists, such as Bergenson in France, think that even Catholic mysticism in the, uh, is the result of some prevailing and noble emotion that arises from the subconscious itself, and then afterwards finds expression in the ideas that judgment, uh, and judgments of the mystics. But a doubt uh, always remains whether these judgments are true that result from an impulse and subconscious self in the affections. Contrary to this, our interior life must be founded on divine truth. 
it already has this from infused faith that rests upon the authority of God's revealing. But study that is properly directed uh, directed is the great help is fully realizing what the truths of the faith are strictly in themselves, independently of our subjective dispositions. Study is of special help indeed in forming a true concept of God's perfections, of goodness, love, mercy, justice, as also the infused virtues of humility, religion, charity, as also without any admixture of emotion that has not its foundations in truth. Therefore, St. Teresa says that she received much help by conversing with good theologians so that she might not deviate from the path of truth in difficult straits. When our study is rightly ordered, it frees the interior life not only from subjectivism, but also from particularism, resulting from an excessive influence of certain ideas prevalent at some period of time or in some region, ideas which after 30 years will appear inadequate. Some years ago, ideas of this or of the particular philosophies prevailed, which now no longer find favorable acceptance. It is in every generation. There is a successive a succession of opinions and events that are uh, that arouse one's admiration. They pass with fashion on the world, while the words of God remain uh, by which the just man must live. Thus, in true study that is well ordered, preserves intact the objectivity which the interior life should have above all deviations of our sensitive nature. It also preserves the universality of the same, which is founded upon the church, founded upon what the church teaches everywhere and at all times. Thus it becomes increasingly clear that the higher and the deeper and the more vital truths are none other than the elementary truths of Christianity, provided that they are thoroughly examined and are become subject of daily meditation and contemplation. Such are the truths enunciated in the Lord's Prayer and in the following words from the first page of the Catechism, quote, What must we do to gain the happiness of heaven? To gain the happiness of heaven, we must know, love, and serve God in this world, end quote. Equally, it is becomes increasingly clear that the fundamental truth of Christianity is, quote, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, end quote. Very, very beautiful text. It is a matter of great importance that these truths profoundly influence our lives without our deviating into subjectivism, sentimental sentimentalism, and particularism prevalent at some period of time or in some region. In this, however, our interior life is in so many ways benefited by good study and by the choicest fruits of penance is to be found in the arduousness of study. It is a fruit much more precious than the natural pleasure to be found in the study that might consist of an intellectual labor not sufficiently sanctified or directed to God. In diligent study that is commanded by charity, we find preeminently verified the common saying, if the roots of knowledge are bitter, its fruits are the sweetest and best. We are not considering here the knowledge that uh, the inflates, but that which under the influence of charity and the virtues of studiousness is truly upbuilding. The interior life which studies saves from a number of deviations, therefore remains objective in its tendencies, and is truly founded on what has been universally and at all times the traditional doctrine. On the other hand, the interior life influences the study of theology. The study of theology owes to the interior life. Often this study remains lifeless, whether viewed in its positive or in its speculative and abstract elements. Sometimes it lacks the noble inspirations and influences of the theological virtues and of the gifts of understanding and wisdom. Hence, theological wisdom is sometimes not the savory knowledge which St. Thomas speaks of in the first question of the theological summa. At times, our mind is occupied too much with dogmatic formulas in the analysis of their concepts and the conclusions deduced from them, and it does not, by means of these formulas, penetrate the mysteries of faith sufficiently to taste its spiritual sweetness and live thereby. Here it is fitting to state it is fitting to state that a number of the saints who were incapable of such serious studies were engaged in uh, were engaging in it is fitting to state that a number of the saints who were incapable of such serious studies as we engage in penetrated these mysteries of faith more deeply. Thus, Francis of Assisi, Saint Catherine of Siena, Saint Benedict, Joseph Lambert, and many others who have certainly did not attempt to analyze in an abstract and speculative matter, the dogmatic conceptions of the Incarnation, Redemption, and the Eucharist 
and did not deduce theological conclusions from or are known to us, yet from the found, fountainhead of these mysteries, with a holy realism, they drew abundance life for themselves. Through the formulas they reached by vital act, and in obscurity of faith, divine reality itself, as St. Thomas teaches, quote, the act of a believer does not terminate in a proposition, but in a thing, end quote, and a revealed truth. Even without the great grace of contemplation, a number of very good Christians by humility and self-denial penetrate in their own way the depths of these mysteries. And if this in fact is and if this fact is verified in these good Christians among the faithful, which far more reason is must be verified in the religious or the priest who has truly understood the dignity of his vocation daily the priest must celebrate the holy sacrifice with a firmer faith a more vivid hope and a more ardent charity so that his eucharistic communion may almost uh, all may be almost every day substantially more fervent and not only preserve but also keep on increasing in him the virtue of charity St. Thomas says, the more a physical motion approaches its minius, the more it is intensified. It is just the opposite with which a violent motion, the throwing of a stone. But grace inclines in a way similar to the nature. Therefore, as a physical motion of a falling stone is always accelerated, so, far, so for those who are in a state of grace, the nearer they approach, the more they must increase in grace. Because the nearer they approach God, the more they are in enticed or drawn by him, just as the sun is drawn toward the center of the earth. If our interior life were to receive such increase of grace every day, it would, almost, it would have a most favorable influence upon our study, and each day this would become more vigorous. Thus study and the life of prayer are causes that interact in a beautiful harmony. Now we're going to talk about the fruit of the mutual influence of the interior life and theology. And this is where we're actually going to be ending in these final two pages. He says, when the priest's interior life is one of great and solid piety, his theology is always more vigorous. After this, theologian has made the descent from faith for the purpose of acquiring theological knowledge by the discussion of particular questions, he desires to return to the source, namely, to ascend to the theological knowledge thus acquired by the discussion of particular questions to the lofty peak of faith. The theologian is like a man who is born on the top of a mountain, for instance, Monte Cassino, and who afterwards descends into the va valley to acquire an accurate knowledge of individual things. Finally, this man wishes to return to his lofty abode, and he may contemplate the whole valley from on high and on a single glance. There are some men who prefer the plains, but others who are more attracted to the mountains. Quote, wonderful is the Lord on high, end quote. So the good theologian must daily breathe the mountain's air derived from the Apostles' Creed and the abundance of spiritual nourishment for himself and also at the end of the Mass from the prologue of St. John's Gospel, which is, as it were, a synthesis of all Christian revelation. Daily, in like manner, he must live his life on the higher plane, directed by the Lord's Prayer, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount in its entirety, which is the synthesis of all Christian ethics and a wondrous elevation. When the priest has, as he should have, the spirit of prayer, when his interior life urges him to severe to search more in dogmatic theology and in moral theology for what savors per preferably in vitality and facility for then under the influence of the gifts of understanding and wisdom faith becomes more penetrating and savory when the most beautiful quasi obscurity in the christian doctrine becomes apparent or the harmonious blends of light and shade which carsacaro in painting holds the intellect spellbound and are the subject of contemplation for the saints as a as an example of this gradually all great questions of grace are reduced to these two possibilities on the one hand god does not command what is impossible but by commanding both admonishes thee to do what thou art able and to pray for what thou art not able to do as saint augustine says who quoted by the council of trent against the protestants on the other hand, against the Pelagians and the Simon Pelagians, we have, quote, For he who, who, dis he who distinguisheth thee 
or what hast thou that thou hast not received, end quote. As St. Thomas says, since God's love is the cause of goodness in things, so one thing would be better than another if God did not well greater good for one that one than for another. These two principles taken separately are clear and most certain, but their intimate reconciliation is very obscure, and the obscurity resulting from too, uh, from too great a light. To perceive this intimate reconciliation, we would have to see how infinite justice, mercy, liberty are reconciled in the imminent deity. Likewise, there are another examples, for in the proportion as in the interior life develops within us. So much the more do we realize the sublimity of the treatise on the incarnation accomplished for the purpose of our redemption, and we are especially impressed with the motivation of the incarnation of the Son of God, quote, who for our for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and became men. In the same way, under the influence of a life of prayer in the treatise of the incarnation is presented to us a more striking light. And among the various opinions concerning the sacrifice of the mass, we are more and more realized that the teaching of the Council of Trent surpasses them all when it states, quote, the victim is one and the same, and the same now offering by the ministry of the priest, and then offered himself on the cross, the manner of offering being different. Increasingly, Christ appears as the high priest, quote, always living to make intercession for us, end quote, especially in the Mass, which is therefore of infinite value. Thus, we gradually discover in the councils those most precious at minute rocks, and likewise in the theological summa, the dominant chapters of or the more sublime articles are by degrees made known to us, which are, as it were, the higher peaks by which the whole mountain range is clearly outlined. If we were to apply ourselves to the study of theology in a true spirit of faith, prayer, penance, we would find verified in these words of St. Thomas, quote, doctrine and preaching proceed from the fullness of contemplation, sometimes in the manner of the preaching of the apostles after the day of Pentecost. Theology understood in the sense Theology understood in this sense is of great importance in the ministry of souls. It is thoroughly imbued as a priest with the spirit of a sound judgment according to the mind of Christ and the church, so that the souls are exhorted to strive after perfection in accordance with their true principles by showing one, for instance, that in accord that according to the supreme precept, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, end quote, all Christians must strive after the perfection of charity each one according, however, according to the manner of his state in life. And we cannot reach this fullness of perfection in Christian life unless our lives are profoundly influenced by the mystery of the incarnation in its redemptive aspects and by the Eucharist, and unless by faith enlightened by the gifts of wisdom and understanding, we penetrate these mysteries with a taste of their sweetness. For this indeed, the study of theology is of great help, provided it be properly deducted, properly directed, not for the satisfaction we get from it, but for the purpose of knowing God better and for the salvation of souls. Thus, these beautiful words of the Vatican Council become increasingly possible of the verification in us, quote, reason enlightened by faith when it speaks earnestly, piously, calmly, attains by a gift of God's sum and that very fruitful understanding of mysteries, and this both from the analogy of those things which are naturally known and from the relation of those mysteries bear one to another and the last end of man, end quote. The study of theology, which sometimes is hard and arduous, though fruitful, thus disposes our minds for the light of contemplation and of life, which is, as it were, an introduction and a beginning of eternal life in us. So in conclusion, what do we gather from this large introduction? We gather a number of things, three broad things. We first and foremost understand the great, the three great epics or periods of the theological science, how it has progressed in time. We also see how St. Thomas Aquinas articulated his method, particularly in an Aristotelian sense. And thirdly, we see most importantly that true theology is found through contemplation, that true theology and true preaching is found in a spirit of contemplation. The reason that we bring these things up 
is because these things lay the groundwork for the study of the beginning, the foundational steps in theology, particularly the one God and on the divine trinity. As we launch now into the first article, the first question of St. Thomas' Summa, we're going to be taking with us this spirit, by God's grace, of charity and of penance in with us so that we may better learn his divine science. At the end of the day, charity is what we need to continue to imbue ourselves with, and this will be hopefully furthered on and spurned by divine science. All right, everyone, thank you so much for watching this second lecture. When we come back, we will be going over the first six articles in the first question of St. Thomas's Summa Theologiae, going through again the commentaries of Father Reginald Garigou Lagrange. It's going to be quite good. You're going to really get to see uh, not just Father Lagrange's uh, wisdom come out, but also his apologetic tone that he writes in uh, contrasting Thomistic doctrine and Catholic doctrine with that, say, of the modernists, the Jansenists, Protestants, rationalists, semi-rationalists, and all a bunch of other isms and ists. Uh, if you liked this video, make sure and give it a thumbs up. And if you're not subscribed, go ahead and subscribe too. We do have an email list down in the bottom if you would like to get in contact with us or if you'd like to stay up to date on these videos. Thank you so much. Also, if you're not uh, gone ahead and subscribed to the Traditional Atomist YouTube channel, I definitely recommend uh, you go ahead and do so. You get videos like this, as well as all types of other videos from interviews to book studies uh, to my own uh, personal advice videos that I'm kind of making, uh, trying to help Catholics out there. So stay tuned for those. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. May our Lord bless you, our Lady keep you, St. Joseph watch over and protect you, and may St. Thomas Aquinas pray for us all. God bless.